This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This programme features live coverage of an African safari. It's a wonderful Sunday and you are looking at a lovely drongo. And now you're looking at me. I am Trishala. Nice to have you on board as always. And we have Craig on camera with us. Yes, we do. So it is completely 100% live and interactive. So you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or of course the YouTube chat stream to communicate with us. Now I have my hand up here because the sun is beating down on us today. It truly is. It's about 32 degrees Celsius, about 89 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is really, really hot. That means that our plan for today is, of course, to look in any shady spots and to look up into the trees and maybe find some sleepy, very hot leopards. Of course, also to check the watering holes, but I have taken the west of the of the reserve at the moment and we have jimmy who will be joining us shortly and you'll meet him and he's taking the east we'll also hopefully be joined by lauren very soon up in the masai mara as well so lots to be excited about today now we do know that tandi has moved off into another area and so have the lions into an area that we can't go into. But the lions move so quickly through Juma and sort of straight through it into the other properties. So we may be lucky and we'll be able to see them as well. All of us are looking for patches of shade to stop in because of this heat. So we know that the animals would possibly be doing the same. I'm seeing a few birds flying around but at the moment I don't think I can hear anything. Let's listen for a second. Oh it's very quiet at the moment. Very quiet. But that'll change as soon as the sun goes down that will change so stay tuned who knows what will happen so while i am on the west or in the west i will be looking for tracks of hukumuri and shidulu of course with hopefully cubs in tow which would be awesome i think now remember we had that skittish male around yesterday as well. Now he doesn't seem to stay in any particular area. Let's try to avoid all the bits of dung. We try to avoid the bits of dung because there may be dung beetles and other little creatures that are in there. And if we drive straight over them, it's not very nice for them, is it? So maybe you guys can tell me what you'd like to see and what you'd expect to see today, considering the heat. Remember, use the hashtag Safari Live and let me know. If you're requesting a pangolin, I suggest you don't tweet. <laughs> oh, it seems that Jimmy is up and running as well. So why don't I send you over to him so he can say good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to Juma here in the Greater Kruger National Park. Um, and Trishala, good luck with that skittish leopard. And yeah, avoid those dung beetles. Um, I'm Jimmy and behind camera is Seb uh, with his thumb and uh, our plan this afternoon is to um, try and stick in the shade as much as possible and move between some of the permanent water because it's 32 degrees here this afternoon um, about double the temperature of the Mara so not too much is going to be active while this sun is beating down on us. Um, you can hear there's not too much bird calls either and uh, so we're going to amble through past different water holes and uh, see what we can find um, and hopefully there we can come up on some elephant or some other um, um, 
antelope drinking and uh, hopefully a, a cat or two. So let's proceed and uh, move on through this heat. Not too many clouds in the sky today. It's uh, Matthew. I got. Uh, did you say how hot was it here? I think so, yes. um, if it was the question, it is uh, 32 degrees in the shade, um, and that's. Oh, sorry. Time. What time is it here? Okay. Uh, it is now. 20 to 4 in the afternoon. South African time. Yes, yeah, some nice shade going into. So if anything's going to be standing around till it starts getting active, it, uh, it will be in these areas where there's a little bit of uh, density and shade just makes it find makes uh, our job finding them a little bit harder but uh, oh we're gonna keep trying to find you something through here and in the meantime we're gonna send you to Trishala who has a surprise for you on her camera Oh my gosh, guys, I've got an ostrich. <laughs> this is the first one I've seen in Juma. This is amazing. Just watch it there coming through the thickets. You should see a gap there in a second. Oh, there's a pair of them. How cool is this? Now, we are sort of in an area where that's a lot more grassy and a little more a little less bushy so this is why they're probably in this side on this side and not so much where further down in the south wow so this is obviously a pair wow let's try and get a little bit closer but i don't want to scare them off what do you think craig mm -hmm. i reckon we can mm -hmm. I think we can. Oh, you guys are as excited as I am, I think. This is quite special. So ostriches prefer this type of landscape. You can see it's quite open and grassy. And that's obviously because of their massive size. They need to be able to move freely. And if they're in the bushes and the thicket, that won't be able to happen. There they are. Stunning. Giraffe girl, you say you've never seen this before? A pair of ostriches right here in Juma? Well, I'll tell you what, I haven't seen it before, not on Juma. I've seen ostriches before, there they go, feeding. Hi guys, welcome to Juma. Is this your first experience here? And you've already made it to live TV or online TV. Go guys. Now these are, of course, the largest and heaviest birds. And they're very ancient birds. Seek truth, you'd like to know if it's a mum and a young one. Oh, look at that prance, look at that. Yes, yes, it's a bit of a model. Um, you asked if this is a mum and a young one. You can tell that there's a bit of a size difference, but I don't think this is a mum and a young one. I think this is a pair. Look at that. Now, the females tend to be slightly browner 
See, this does look like two males. Oh, look at that. Look at that pose. I always think they look like ballet dancers. They've got these stockings and then these very extravagant tutus on almost. Of course, the neck doesn't look very much like a ballet dancer, especially not when it's down there. But look at that. Now, they mostly eat plant material or vegetation, so that's what this one is going after at the moment. Very, very cool. Omkar, you'd like to know how tall they are? Well, the males can get up to two meters tall, so if I had to stand in front of them, they'd tower over me. I am only about 1.58 meters tall, so they would definitely, definitely tower over me. Guys, this is so amazing to me. Now, I saw an ostrich not too long ago in the town very close by here, and this ostrich started to do a bit of a dance to me um, <laughs> and whack his head from side to side against his body. And in the time that I was thinking, what are you doing? He sprinted towards me, and there was just the fence in between us. So these guys can actually be quite intimidating if they decide that they don't like you. Check them out, just pulling little bits of seeds from those grasses and of course little fresh vegetations or vegetation that's right at the bottom. Wow, now it looks like one ostrich with two necks. <laughs> Absolutely stunning. So like we spoke about, two meters tall, about a hundred kgs for the males, about 90 for the females. Oh, look at that breeze. Now, these guys are not designed for flight. And even though you can think that they probably have a really big wingspan if they had to open it up, their feathers are actually not designed for flight. Or rather, they've been reduced in terms of the sort of barbs and hooks that hold feathers together. They don't have that very much. And if you've seen an ostrich feather, it's not intact, like in the same way as other birds' feathers are, and rigid and hard in order to get the air to flow over them. These feathers are very, very soft and they're not really linked together by those barbs like the other feathers are. Look at it. Hello. And look at how brightly colored that beak is. The silence of the bush has finally given us something wonderful. Isn't this nice? I am so excited. I am just going to call this in because this is quite a rare sighting. Maybe some other people would like to join us and I'm sure a wider audience would like to join us as well. So let me call this in quickly and then we can invite some more people on board here. Good afternoon, Mobile Stations. It's Trish from Wild Earth. I have located a pair of ostriches on Sandy Patch, um, just where the junction of Aubrey's and Sandy Patch is, maybe moving about 100, meter, 100 meters west. Well, yes, I think we could have some more people on board. This is truly rare. Ah, so someone else has just told me that these two have been here earlier in the day and they've already seen them. Copy, they're lovely. Really, really nice. When you see something like this, sometimes it's just really cool to just sit and watch them because all of the things that you read in the books are just nothing compared to sitting and watching them in their way that they behave. <laughs> mm. 
Hello and welcome everybody. We are here in Juma Private Game Reserve and we have quite a rare sighting. It's a pair of ostriches right here in the western section of the park. Isn't this beautiful? Now we don't often see them here, which is why it's such an exciting moment. And they're here in the short grass, in the grassland on this side. Wow. And you can see the tall legs and the long necks. Absolutely stunning. Look at those big feathers. And they're feeding along quite happily on all the vegetation as they go. They've been very good to us. Absolutely beautiful. Is that arrow or owl? You say that they're as big as trees. They certainly can be as big as trees. Two meters tall, that's what we said. See this one starting. Oh, <laughs> put that neck to good use. You can scratch all the way around. Now, I think what we're looking at is actually two males when you get a sight of the other one. Ooh. Karen, you say they are huge. They are huge. If you think, look at him there with this standing with the neck up straight. Now you can get a good idea of the height there. That is a tall bird. Very tall bird right there. We don't often get to see that. You often, oh, you see them in more of this relaxed pose. Even that, he's still a bit stiff with the neck up, held up, up high. Wow, absolutely stunning. Now these are very ancient birds and they are huge. Males to about 100 kgs, females to about 90 kgs. Really, really big guys. Now I'm saying that these are both males because the males are mostly black and they have a bit of white on the wings and of course a white bit on the tail, which is what we're seeing there. That's a bit dirty at the moment. And for the females, it's a bit more browny, a bit grayish. Very cool. Barbara, you'd like to know how I think related the penguins are to the ostriches well of course they are both birds so they do fit I suppose into the same group but they have ah how much water do they need compared to penguins well of course penguins <laughs> need a whole lot of water because they are water dependent in order to to eat and survive and breed whereas <laughs> Nina, <laughs> cancel penguins, she says. You mean ostriches. How much is the requirement of ostriches? I am not quite sure, but I would think that they would need some water. We see birds always near the dams and things like that looking for water. So I would assume that they would need sun, but I would check up for you definitely. Now I'm going to reposition because they're still around you and they're moving quite slowly and they're being very good to us. So let's do this quickly. Now, they are quite used to the heat and you do see them in sort of arid areas. So they are not so much looking for shade as much as I am, are they? Ah, there we go. Here we've got a small gap. How's that, Craig?
Very cool. Glendy, you'd like to know what I would suppose our predators would do if they'd come across these ostriches. Did I hear that correctly? Sorry, I was just repositioning at the same time there. See, they've noticed us and they're quite still at the moment. I would suppose that they may try to hunt these ostriches, but hunt ostriches are really, really big. And they also have quite dangerous claws on their feet. To the extent where I once read a story about a guy who had an interaction with an ostrich and it went foul, unfortunately. And the, the ostrich had actually ripped through the front of his shirt and his leather belt. So that'll give you an idea of exactly how strong and sharp those claws of the ostrich are. Look at those knobbly knees. Now, lots of them can actually gather together, but what we're seeing here is just a pair for the moment. Even though they do mostly eat vegetation, they ha have been known to eat termites every now and then, especially the juveniles. There they go, walking away, the pair head held high, absolutely stunning. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this. And remember that if you'd like to keep on watching, you can go onto YouTube and just type in Safari Live and you can keep on watching this completely live. There'll be these ostriches and many, many other animals. So please do. guys don't you think so now look how they hold their head just above the ground I think on average they hold their head about 30 centimeters above the ground so it's really easy to just snap that Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> now if you look at actually the way that it just moved you could see that if it were running and being chased by a predator like we were asked earlier it could easily change directions and sort of move from side to side. But I've said this before, they can be quite intimidating and they look quite intimidating, especially if they want to give you a bit of a display and they start swinging their necks around and hitting the sides of their body. There they go behind that bush. Let's try and get a little bit of a better view of them. I want to make the most of this because it's something we don't see very often. They seem to be fairly comfortable. Oh, they've moved up on the other side now. Oh, there's a bit of an animal, animal path in front of us. Hopefully we can use that to get to them. Also, don't want to. Uh, yeah. You know, I just had this feeling to come to the west today, and I'm so glad that I did. Okay, I'm just going to get over this, and then we will stop. Sorry if you see any blurriness or pixelation, if we're just having a small difficulty at the moment. So I'm just going to stay put so we can get good signal coming through to you guys. Really huge. Wow, it really is quite awe-inspiring to be in front of them. 
because they are big. Let's go further along the road. Let's just check with Nina if, my, if our signal is all good. Is it Nina? If it is, we can move off. It's quite nice because you can see their heads above the bushes just a bit. Well, they seem to have moved off, so I will try to keep up with them. Um, but in the meantime, let me send you to Lauren, who has finally gotten out. So let's go up to the Masai Mara. Good afternoon. We are here, after all, in the Mara. We just had some gremlin issues to deal with. But ostriches in Juma? Ostriches in Juma? I can't believe it. I'm so happy for Trushala. That is indeed awesome. Now, of course, my name is Lauren, and on camera, I have bungee cord. And today we are out. It is extremely hot, and we have managed to solve all of our technological issues. So we are indeed on our way to investigate some lions. I don't know what lions that are yet, but we will indeed investigate a little bit further and hopefully figure out who they are. Our initial plan was to go to the border and visit the beautiful Lamai brothers. That is a coalition of two brothers of Cheetah. However, I think we better stay in the safe zone today. The border is very far away due to the fact that these gremlins might come back and try to battle with us again. So we're going to keep our plan a little bit more local but I promise you within the next few days I will get to these Cheetah Brothers and we will be able to explore them a little bit further. So for now lions will have to be the case. Now last night here in the Maasai Mara we had an absolutely incredible and torrential storm. It nearly blew all of our tents over to be honest and wow it was incredible so i do believe the rains are very much on their way now and the season is starting to change luckily we were all tucked up inside together watching a movie so it's absolutely fine but it was an incredible storm so it's been very quiet in the mara front today so we're going to try and do as much exploring and investigating as we can for now but other than that i don't have any real updates now i'm not sure if Patrick this morning was able to give you a little bit more details about the giraffe incident but he actually went and checked and the mother nor the dead calf remain anymore so the mother has indeed gone we don't know where she's gone but I do believe at some point she just will have moved off. As far as I can tell, the North Clan were really grown in numbers and indeed they managed to get hold of the calf and claim it for their own. So nothing remains there, the mother is not there, there's a hyena in sight and there's also not a carcass. So as sad as that may sound, indeed the situation is over. The mother held out for as long as she absolutely could but indeed the situation for now is of course over. So that makes me feel a little bit better that the mother can rest, shall we say? Yes, that makes me feel a little bit better. So that was my update on the giraffe situation for now. But other than that, I'm just bumbling and hopefully we will come across something exciting and the rains do stay off. I'm absolutely terrified for these rains that are due to come. Not looking forward to driving in them, but you know, I didn't even bring my welly boots from Scotland. I do have a multi-coloured selection of welly boots and I didn't bring them. So indeed, we are going to bumble on for now and hopefully get to these lions soon. But you guys are going to go back down to South Africa to see what Jimmy is up to. Well then, Trishala, um, nice to see some ostrich in this part of the world, not too common. And uh, welcome back, Lauren. I'm glad you survived the storm up in East Africa. Um, we are just moved through quite a big drainage line and had a lot of elephant tracks. Um, so we're going to try and get around and follow up and see if we have any luck. Um, 
sometimes up on these crests you get some big trees with some shade um, so we'll be moving up to that area um, we also had a, a, a small antelope um, down in this drainage line called a, a bushbuck, but they're quite elusive. We tried to stop and see if we could get it to stick around, but they don't, uh, they're not very um, used to camera, they're a bit camera shy. So sadly, we couldn't hold on to it. <laughs> we uh, back out into the heat here and uh, we should get some big shade on the top of these uh, these ridges. Very interesting how Lily, the the harshest, the hardest animal to catch on camera, um, I would say in this area. Probably um, pangolin, some of the nocturnal stuff. Um, so I would say pangolin, uh, porcupine to a, to a certain extent. Um, and a pangolin is that, is a, um, a scaly anteater. And uh, they're noc very nocturnal. Um, also quite uh, very difficult to find. Um, but once you find them, they're very slow moving, so they're not too difficult to follow. Um, and if they sense any danger, they'll just roll up into a ball. Um, I've seen a couple of them, and funny enough, uh, a, a few times I've found them uh, from predators um, actually finding them and playing with them. So um, that's a way if you follow predators, they'll sometimes come across them and roll, and they instinctively roll up, and then they'll they'll play with them and then you can go in and see what's going on and that's how you often find pangolin. So I would say pangolin, um, probably one of the more difficult things. Um, and then also probably um, hard to get on film is uh, sometimes uh, different animals um, hunting and, and, uh, and killing because you often done at night and you don't want to um, you don't want to affect the hunt, so that would be very difficult unless it's a diurnal animal. Um, often cheetah, well, cheetah will normally always hunt in daylight hours or, uh, or full moon. They've been known to hunt in full moon, so they're a little bit easier to catch uh, on, on camera um, hunting. Um, leopard are pretty diverse. They'll hunt day and night, so they've been... Uh, good captures of leopard hunting in the day so yeah uh, but there's a lot of stuff that's difficult to get on catch on film um, births obviously um, different animals giving birth especially your smaller stuff see how hot it's getting these I'm just going to point out something to you, Seb. If you can just shine on, onto these, these, yeah. I'm just going to show you. There's definitely moisture needed in this part because you can see these, what we call round leaf teaks, and uh, when they're small, they're very shrubby. Um, you can see how they're wilting with the heat, um, and they'll only really perk up when when we get some more rain. Um, they, in this area, they seldom get to be big trees because elephants absolutely love them. Um, it's like elephant pudding, these. <laughs> um, and uh, they get a, a nice yellow flower in, nice yellow flower in summer. So speaking of elephants, um, we're gonna continue to find uh, some elephants, but we'll, we're going to send you to Lauren, who apparently has some for you. I 
do indeed have many elephants, extremely happy elephants, actually, who seem to have been wallowing and splashing around in some sort of puddle that I'm not quite able to see. And they are obviously escaping this very intense mid, well, it's getting not midday anymore, a little bit later than midday, but we have a bunch of happy elephants here. And obviously, elephants are highly social animals. And indeed, they actually make use of such an array of communication from smelling, communicating verbally, listening, rumbling in all sorts of ways, even touching that we're not aware of. And actually, this is one of the things that most fascinates me, nonverbal communication. And this is why I love looking at animals so much. So believe it or not, I actually have a history of sign language. From a child, I actually grew up signing. Now, I am not deaf and no one in my family is deaf, but we grew up signing for the deaf. British sign language, of course. Unfortunately, I am not familiar with American sign language. But let me reintroduce myself. Bunge, are you ready for this? And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean and why I am telling you this. So, this is how I used to speak to deaf people when we were at home. We would greet each other completely silently. So, it would, of course, be hello. How are you? Good afternoon. My name is Lauren. And this has just fascinated me since I've been a child, how people and animals can communicate completely non-verbally. And that's exactly what these elephants are doing here. So we do hear them make noises. We do hear them make rumbles and grumbles and even trumpets. Actually, elephants can be very verbal and they can, of course, be very noisy. But they also have a huge other range of communications that's really hard to get grip of. They can actually communicate seismically so what that means is that the tip of an elephant's trunk actually has layers of cells in it that are extremely sensitive to vibrations. So they're actually able to detect movement of one another and their surroundings from those really sensitive cells on the tips of their trunk and even on the bottom of their foot. So this is another form of communication that humans, I guess, can just struggle to get their head around. I can definitely struggle to get my head around around that because obviously this is not a capability of humans and it is just absolutely utterly fascinating i mean not even that the frequencies that the elephants can use to communicate with one another of course some we can hear we can hear very loudly that was a noise of some sort there but of course they actually use frequencies that are even so low for humans to hear they can be as low as about 12 hertz, and that is completely out of the human range. So this whole herd here could be communicating to one another in extremely low frequency rumbles, and we're just obviously not able to pick it up. And this is indeed how a herd of elephants is actually able to stay together and find one another if they do get lost. They're communicating in all sorts of different ways. And just to give you an indication, human male's voice actually fluctuates around 110 hertz. So if you think of 110 hertz for a human male's voice, and of course, all males do sound different. I am aware of that. 110 hertz, and then you think about an elephant rumbling at 12 hertz. And that is incredibly different. An incredibly different range there that humans are obviously just not capable to imagine. And this is probably what's happening right here. Mariko's asking, can an elephant be deaf? What a fantastic question. And honestly, I don't 100% know the answer, but I would believe they could be. If they were born, if there was maybe a genetic problem since birth, I believe, I guess, an elephant could be. Or maybe if it damaged its ear in some way, I guess indeed it could be. But an animal like this could survive and thrive because they have so many other forms of communication through these vibrations that they're able to detect, through touching, through visual. As long as they've got their eyes, they can see one another. As long as they've got their trunks, they can touch one another. So indeed, even if an elephant was deaf, 
I really don't think it would hinder its life much at all. And this is what fascinates me about animals. Humans are so reliant on certain forms of communication that we forget to think animals have so many different ways of communicating, ways that we don't even think of because humans are so used to thinking in our very human-like ways. So I don't know of any deaf elephants, but I do believe that it's definitely possible. So I will indeed check that out for sure. Just what a fascinating topic. And it's just fascinated me since I was a child. How can we communicate non-verbally? And I guess humans do on a daily basis anyway, through body language, eye gazes, um, facial expressions all sorts of things that maybe we're not even aware of. Mm, Lady Starfire, good to hear your name. Do elephants with missing trunk tips, that's quite a mouthful, have trouble communicating? And no, they don't. And it goes back to the fundamental part that we've actually seen quite a few elephants missing the tips of their trunk. And although they maybe have to adjust their body posture or adjust their mannerisms in order to feed, they can still use their trunk because it's only the tip that is missing. So they can still use that in body line language or touching one another and indeed the soles of the feet do contain these special cells for detecting vibrations as well so it's not just the tip of the trunk so as long as they can still feed and they can still drink the trunk will still operate so indeed I do not think that would affect them in terms of communication elephants also have body language that we can even read we know when we can leave an elephant alone or possibly when an elephant's not happy. So they can also read each other's body language. And there's just so many ways that these fantastic animals can communicate. And I just think elephants in general are incredible that way. And I'm sure there's more that we don't even know, that we haven't even learned about these fantastic mammals. But indeed, they have such a variety of ways to communicate that even if, say, for example, one is deaf or the other one has lost the tip of its trunk, then indeed I really do not think that would hinder the elephant's lifestyle at all. What a lovely sighting. They've all just completely got wet, cooled down, and they're on the move. Feeding and moving at the same time. They're actually all around us. We've got some to the other side as well. Gary's asking, do elephants communicate with other animals? That's quite a tricky question to answer. I'm not sure it's even possible to answer because it's not possible really for interspecies communication to work quite like that. So, oh, Bungay just pointed out some more. We've got a tiny small one over there as well. <laughs> so yes, it doesn't work quite like that because of course, if a lion was to approach these elephants right now, they would indeed react in the elephant way, if that makes sense. So they would most likely herd together. They would most likely make themselves look even bigger than they already do. They would trumpet, they would charge, their tails would go erect. They would definitely show that they're not happy the lion or lions are present. But in terms of communicating with the lion, I do not indeed think that is possible, but they will show their dislike for the lion's presence. And there's many, well, a lot of footage online where you see elephants really showing their dislike of other animals coming far too close to them. So indeed, they would communicate it, but in their own elephant way, which I am sure a lion would probably understand because it's very visual, it's very loud. And indeed, these are very big mammals. So I am more than sure that the lion or whichever other animal it would could be would indeed get the point and most likely leave the elephants alone. So very tricky question, Gary, but I hope that made sense. Obviously, between two different species, it's not possible to communicate like that. So that was a lovely, lovely topic to start this afternoon's drive. So while we do continue on and I'm going to keep thinking about all the non-verbal ways that animals communicate, we are going to send you back down to Trishala and her ostriches. Yes, it really is wonderful the way that animals communicate. And 
elephants especially because they are absolutely beautiful and Lauren was telling you about how they communicate in all sorts of different ways. So even if they are deaf or something's wrong with them, they still have all these other means of communication. And you know what? I'm sure that humans do too. It's just that we're so focused on language that we forget. Now, I'm still with these guys. Trying to just follow them down and not too closely. I love the way that they kind of prance. Watch them as they walk. Now, now is the time. On the right of your screen is Juma, and on the left is a different reserve. So, where will you go? Back into Juma, yes. And now I love the way that they pick up their legs as they walk, sort of like they're walking on hot coals. Very cool. And you can see those bare legs, they lose a lot of heat from those bare legs. But in this type of environment, that's very useful. Because can you imagine carrying around that mop of feathers? Oh no, and they've crossed into Buffalo's Hook. Now I've got a question of where I think the female ostriches are. <laughs> and back again. Claudia, you'd like to know where I think the female ostriches are? I have no idea. Probably co close by. I mean, they do often stay in big groups or bigger groups than at least a pair. Now they've gone back into Juma, so they're just zigzagging. So the females could be, I suppose, it's such a vast area, they could be anywhere really. But we haven't seen them on Juma, that's for sure. Oh, where have you gone? Where have you gone? They've almost taken me halfway back. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. See how they're zigzagging across. Now, we were speaking about the water requirement of them before. So I had a bit of a read. And from what I understand, they're not very water dependent so they can metabolize the moisture out of the things that they eat the nice lush vegetation but if water is around they will drink and they will drink as often as they can <laughs> I feel like they need a soundtrack for as they walk away it really does look like the road is very hot for them, doesn't it? Where will you go? Where will you go? With your tights. Can't you see the ballerina look that I spoke about? Now, if you get a good look at those legs, the thigh muscles look quite well developed. Ah, and they've crossed into the other side. Ah, how unfortunate. But like I said, they've been zigzagging, so maybe they'll come right back and we said I was telling you about those muscles just as they walked off and I would have liked to show you that they're quite well developed and it's because they kick quite a lot as a defense and if you got kicked by that whoo you would break something ah you guys would like to see the tracks of the ostriches let's go find some now we know we, they crossed right ahead there so let's go find some of those tracks Be careful not to drive over them. That's really interesting. I'd love to see the tracks of them too. Come on, Trishala, don't drive over them. Uh, do you see any, Craig? I see a few there. Do you see them? Cool. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Actually, let me jump off and have a good look at them. Which one have you got in frame, Craig? Don't want to walk onto them. Wow, this is the first time I've seen something like this. Very odd looking, don't you think? I know nothing about ostrich tracks yet. But this is a good example. Now you see what a fresh track looks like. Craig gave me this look like there were lions behind me. Don't do that, Craig. <laughs> like Craig just said to me, ostriches can be quite dangerous on foot. Like I said to you, that guy had that attack with them. the ostrich sort of ripped him right through here. I think it's a very odd track, but you, I suppose you can sort of see... Uh, you can sort of see the nails or the, the claws, but it's such an odd track. Well, I'll tell you what, I won't forget this now. If I see an ostrich track, I'll know exactly what it looks like. Just going to have a look further down. Making sure that they're not behind me. Very cool. Well, that was nice to experience with you guys. There's a very small footprint there. Ah, there they are walking in the road. Let's hop back on. Looks, looks like they're going for, they're walking on their way to an audition. See how what I meant about how they're zigzagging? In and out of Juma, in and out of Juma. Very cool. And moving back into Juma. Come on, guys, do it. We'd like to keep you here. Oh, well, it seems that Lauren has found something with a very long neck also up in the Masai Mara. So let's go to her. Indeed, we have, of course, came across a tower of giraffes, which is indeed quite ironic as we were just talking about them. Although most of them are walking, which I think makes it a journey of giraffes rather than a tower. And to continue on the conversation, I was actually asked the other day about the vocalizations of giraffes. And it's funny that we are just talking about, well, I'm just talking about nonverbal communication because indeed I have actually learned a lot about giraffes and it's way deeper than I actually thought it went. So giraffes do tend to be more on the silent side, especially compared to elephants, which we did just speak about. But indeed, they were thought to be so tight lipped and silent for a long time. And one of the theories was that they do have a voice box, they do have a larynx, but due to this very long neck, that they weren't able to get a proper airflow in and make adequate vocalizations. Now, this myth has been completely debunked, and in fact, they do. Especially when they're distressed, they will make a very deep bellow, which is a hard thing to listen to, but giraffes really can force out a big bellow when they want. But not only that, believe it or not, they are actually hummers. Now, I'm not a hummer myself, but indeed, giraffes are said to hum all night long. Can you believe that? I honestly had no idea of that either. And it's supposed to be on the very low end of the frequency scale. Now, not as low as elephants, but for the human hearing range or the human acoustic range, it isn't classified as infrasound, but it's very, very on the low end for the human hearing. So I'm sure humans couldn't really possibly hear it. But of course, they've done many experiments on it. Um, 
Giraffes obviously have excellent vision and they are the lighthouses out here. You know, they can see for miles and many other animals rely heavily on them for clues as to what's going on. But indeed, once it gets dark, if you think about it, relying heavily on, on vision or visual clues becomes almost difficult. It becomes almost impossible. We've just got some giraffes crossing the roads in front of us here as well. So if they can't sort of rely on their vision anymore because it's dark, then what are they going to rely on to communicate? And here you go. Apparently they hum all throughout the night to keep in contact and communicate with one another. So it's not loud enough to attract predators, but indeed the giraffes can communicate with one another when the vision is non-existent. So isn't that incredible? And it's one of the ways that giraffes actually are able to stay together in a sort of loose aggregation like they form because they can hear each other. It's just humans that cannot. Incredible, incredible stuff. And of course, I've spent a... Well, the last few days with giraffes, shall I say, and it's been very intense. And of course, I've just got a newfound respect for these wonderful, wonderful animals. And indeed, they're a lot noisier than you think they are. Isn't that just amazing? So, of course, we are on our mission to get to the lions, but we keep encountering roadblocks of every shape and size. I didn't quite catch the name, but I do know I am being asked, how do we tell the age of a giraffe? Okay, let's see if we can get a little bit closer to this one at the back, Bungay. And indeed, Bremeth, I think is the name. You can see straight away from the genitals, this is male. So the males are much larger in size than the females. And indeed, those sort of patches that they have on their skin indeed do get darker with age and their size increases with age. And also the ossicones on the top of their head, and they're not horns, they are indeed ossicones, become balder and balder and balder as the males age. So the best thing to sort of look at is a combination of things, coloration, size, and of course the ossicones. But other than that, it's very difficult to age a giraffe. It's very, very difficult. And when you see a male and female together, you would be surprised at how different in size they actually are. I think this is a female here, having a wee nudge of the male. Oh, that was nice. Because when you look at a female, you think, wow, that's a very big animal. But actually, when you stand a female next to a male, a male does tower above her. <laughs> you see what I did there? So indeed, it's very difficult to age a giraffe. But as they get older, the patches get darker. The male ossicones get much bolder. And indeed, size comes into play as well. So it is a tricky one. But those are the things you can indeed look for when you are looking at giraffes. So obviously they're all wandering off into the distance here. So we are indeed going to wander on our mission as well. Ah, oh, Spass, I have not heard your name in so long. And I remember we had to get properly taught how to say your name and dive live. A lot of people think it is CNAC, but it's not. Nice to hear from you. Now, how do you tell if a giraffe is pregnant? I think that was the question. Oh, I got more traffic. Nobody wants to let me go where I'm going today. Indeed, swollen belly. Swollen belly is what you look at in a giraffe. Now, these are buffaloes, so I'm just going to let them cross because buffaloes can indeed get a little bit cross themselves if you cross them. Cross, cross, cross. So, of course, giraffes will indeed get a big swollen belly, just like other animals, just like humans, and you will see the mammary glands starting to swell as well. And that is the best way and the best thing to look at to tell if a giraffe is pregnant. But it's not easy, of course, even within your big predators and your big cats, it can be really tricky. I remember we were having a discussion quite some time ago about the possibility of Tandy being pregnant. And it is tricky because especially in the cats, their bellies swell just like mine do when they eat a lot of food, a proper food belly. And of course, that could easily be mistaken for being pregnant. But normally a cat, the belly will swell, but much lower towards the 
rear end rather than a big swollen food belly. And of course, you will see signs of preparation for lactation, swollen mammary glands, all sorts of things. So it isn't indeed easy, but those are the cues that you can look for. Now, buffaloes, are you going to move out of my way? <laughs> Possibly not, by the looks of things. We are possibly going to block Lauren's road for as long as possible. There we go. We finally have a clear road ahead. So while we get up and go, we're going to send you back to Jimmy because he has a bird. Um, Jimmy had a bird, uh, so, uh, there's a pair of them, so we're going to reposition, and they're a little bit far, but we still have them in sight, um, oh, I'm not sure if you can see that, um, but what we have here is a adult and sub-adult battalier eagle. Um, you can just, there we are now, you can see its lovely red beak. It's preening itself. There was, I think, I can't see from here, but the, I think this is an adult and a, there was a sub-adult that just flew off. Now, the sub-adults take about seven years to get to full plumage. Um, and to get to full maturity. This is a, it gets its name from a French word, batelier, which apparently means um, tightrope walker, because it's got a typical wavy flight in the air. It sort of dips from side to side slightly. It very seldom flaps because they rely heavily on thermals. And being a, a lightish bird with broad wings, they probably, well, they are one of the first raptors up in the morning. So if their thermal's around, the battalia will be up in the air. And uh, they are also known to scavenge. And uh, they will often, between battalia and tawny eagles, will often lead you to carcasses. And then later in the day, obviously the vultures will come, out, come down onto carcasses because they bigger, heavier birds, they need more thermal. So we'll just sit here a bit longer to see if uh, either its mate or the sub adult comes back and we're gonna send you off to Trishala Oh, there's another raptor. I am driving, but I found something. Ah, and he's run away, just as I say that. Let's see if we can get, get a better position behind us. There's a pair of warthogs. And they've vanished. Can you see them, Craig? Nah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we, I saw two warthogs just running along there. I quite like them. Near where I live, we get a lot of warthogs. One's even tried to come into my lounge before. <laughs> it can be quite funny. Especially when you both freeze and you look at each other. And you're probably feeling the exact same thing. Slight shock. Slightly don't want them to come much closer. One had his head already through the door. And of course, they can be quite dangerous because they're packing a lot of weight into that small body. You're talking about 90 kgs for the males into that, into that little body. So can you imagine how solid they are? If that had to run into you, into your legs, they're going to break your legs, especially with those sharp tusks as well. Oh, let's look at these lovely guys.
Hello. Lovely Impala. This is a nice bachelor herd. You can see they're all males with their beautiful horns chewing away. Oh, let's focus on this one who's chewing. And there's one scratching behind him because I didn't see him tuck his head down, so he's probably chewing some cud, which is the partially digested... Oh, he stopped to talk to me. Partially digested food that he would basically vomit back up and then re-chew. A bit of grooming as well. Now, of course, they will begin to spa and the rutting will begin soon again. Lots of things going on. We've got some eating, some pooing, some grooming. The day's ablutions. Really spectacular horns. See, there's a female that just came through. Ah, there's a few females at the bottom there. There we go. Now you... Oh, look at that tongue. <laughs> now you'll notice that their mouths move from side to side. So they can't really open their mouths up to chew like we can and that most carnivores do. So that's one of the things that, oh, something spooked it there. It looked like that elephant dung spooked it. So they chew from side to side and that's necessary to grind up all of this vegetation that they eat. And remember that most mammals in fact, all mammals can't digest cellulose on their own. Our digestive system just can't. Mrs. Lapwing, you would like to know, would they, would they split up during the rut? Is that what I heard correctly or not? But during the rutting season, the males will sort of start to find a little bit a little bit of territory and that's when they become ter territorial is during this rutting season they want to bring as many females into their patch as possible so now you see the males are still together so once the rutting season season is in full swing the males will sort of despise each other for a little bit Now, can you see this this little one here with the horns that are looking like a horseshoe? Now, this guy is from about 2017. So the ones, if you see ones that have little buds of horns that are coming out, they're from November, December, whenever the first lot was born that just passed to so 2018 but these guys here that have the horseshoe shaped horns they are probably from the year before in fact they are from the year before while these ones do the impressive horns are fully grown and adults really beautiful I often often think that they don't get the attention they deserve because they're so numerous People think that it doesn't really matter. But I think they're lovely. Walking along, along on the road. Very cute. Anyway, it seems that Lauren is on the search for some lions. I think that's a wonderful idea. I'd like to do that too. So I'll be looking out for tracks. In the meantime, let's go over to Lauren and see how her search is going. So two kingfishers can you believe it and of course doing what birds typically do they have flown off oh my first kingfishers of the mara and indeed they did not want to reveal themselves which is incredibly annoying but we're almost at the area where the lions are so we are going to continue forward now there's a bit of a barrier ahead but do not worry we will get through it oh. How frustrating was that? They were beautiful. They were pied kingfishers. And there was indeed two of them. 
Now, going back to communication, lions are a very interesting one. And of course, we're not there yet, but we are going to get there and we are going to find them because indeed they communicate in a huge variety of ways. Of course, mainly when they separate, when males separate or females within a pride separate, they will roar. And of course, the roar is one of the loudest of all the cats. And this is due to their unique biology, which indeed allows them, their voice box vibrates, and it allows them to obviously roar and call out as loud as possible. And it's said it can even be heard up to seven kilometers away if the weather allows for it. Of course, if there's wind, bad weather, other noise, then of course, the roars will not be heard. But other than that, that is how lions communicate. And we've even seen lions themselves contact calling and doing all sorts of things. Hello. That's my communication. So indeed, when lions get separated, they will roar. But when they're not separated and they're together, they're relying heavily on olfactory clues, their nose. Your, our nose is sometimes forgotten about out of all the senses. Well, definitely not mine. I have an extremely sensitive nose. However, they will communicate, for example, within their urine. It will actually give away a lot of clues about reproductive states. So the males will get clues from the females by doing that famous Fleming grimace, by pumping in all the clues into the palate of the mouth, where there is a special organ that houses chemoreceptors. And they obviously receive the chemical clues and the lion, the male lion, will know, hey, hey, this lady is ready. Or, oh, this lady is not ready. But in all seriousness, the female has to communicate if she's an estrus or not. Otherwise, reproduc reproductive efforts will indeed go to waste. What is the point in mating, which takes a lot of effort for lions, it goes on for a long period of time, and indeed it's very frequent, it's very exhausting for them. More traffic. Hello Impala. So yes, what is the point in going through all that mating process, that whole week of frequent and intense mating, which exhausts both parties, if the female wasn't ready? So the female leaves clues and of course it's all in that sense of smell and it's not just lions for example lobsters who everyone seems to think are monogamous I think Phoebe from Friends said that lobsters are monogamous and that they hold claws not true sorry another myth that is being debunked they're serial monogamous and what does that mean well the male will be in his den and again the female will wait outside and she will waft her urine into the den until he accepts it until he says okay yeah i'm gonna let this lady in she won't go in otherwise because male lobsters can be very aggressive and he will look after her during the time of mating to which she will completely molt her shell so she will be very vulnerable but he will look after her he will mate with her and then indeed once it's over and her shell is reformed she leaves and the next lady waits outside so again, for lobsters, it's all to do with the olfactory clues. The woman wafting in her urine and saying, hello, anybody there? I would like to come in. <laughs> Very strange way for us to think about it. But within the animal kingdom, if they can't say, hi, Mr. Lion, I'm ready, would you like to mate? Then how else are they gonna communicate with one another? And one of the main forms is, of course, using that sense of smell. Isn't that incredible? So it's not just on land, it's obviously in the water as well. So from lions to lobsters, I think we managed to cover quite a bit of smell here. Now let's just say hello to the zebra. Hi, guys because they are indeed everywhere, mixed in with a few Thompson's gazelles. Now, zebra are just a wonderful sight to see. I do enjoy spending time with zebra. And of course, these are also animals that do indeed use the sense of smell to pick up on clues about what is going on in the environment around them. And they do indeed do the Fleming grimace as well, which is hilarious to watch when animals or humans attempt to do it and of course they're just trying to understand what's going on they're trying to perceive their own environment and indeed animals will perceive the environment differently just as humans perceive things differently and one of my favorite quotes actually is there's no truth only perception 
And indeed, that is what each animal will do, pick up clues in the various ways of communicating to perceive its own environment. And that is how they survive. And sometimes you just have to get into the head of the animal to actually understand how an animal does survive and thrive in its own ecological niche. Is that a scratch on that zebra's bottom? Indeed it is. Oh, woof! The one on the left is much worse. I think this zebra has indeed been involved. Sorry for the close-up zebra <laughs> on your sensitive parts, but that wound on the left leg looks rather deep. It has potentially came from an animal who has been chasing it, possibly even a lion. But that does look rather painful. Mm, sorry, Zebra. Now, talking of lions, we are going to continue on our original mission, which is indeed to find those lions that we have indeed just been talking about. Now, we will get there one day. There just happens to be a lot of traffic in the form of cars and many, many different animals that all want to cross the road in front of me. So, it's starting to cool down here for sure, but I'm not sure it's getting any relief down in Juma. So, we're going to send you down to Jimmy to see what he's up to. No, it hasn't cooled down much yet here, but we are just moving into some thick stuff after a leopard. Um, and um, your sons are here. We are. Look at this. Um, there we go, we've um, just moved into this thick stuff and we believe it's Tundi. Um, I haven't seen for definite but I believe it's Tundi um, on the move here and it's surprising how she's moving in this heat. Um, so we're going to try and skirt around maybe and get a better visual so while we, not much are oh, there, you can just see her through these branches. I wonder if she's not seen something here. Definitely looking and listening. We don't want to move at the moment because we might disrupt what's going on here. off there. It's nice to see her. We've uh, we had a glimpse of her yesterday um, in a very thick drainage line but lost her very quickly so it's nice to be able to catch up with her again. I'm just going to ease forward here and get a better view. as if they heard something there. I wonder if she hasn't heard some nyala or... I 
think what I'm going to... What do you think, Seb? Seen something, eh? Or... Yeah, should we maybe move around to you? gonna just uh, get into a better position and send you over to Trishala while we ease into the to the north of her without trying to disrupt her oh well good luck Jimmy I'm so glad that there might be if well he'll you hopefully hopefully find the leopard again it's been a really, really cool, entertaining day. So I thought, ah, come on, butterflies. It's as if they knew they were going live and then they decided to all fly away. So we're here by this little mud wallow on the side of the road and we have these butterflies that are flapping away. You can see that. Now, I'm not 100% sure on an exact species, but I think that the family that they're in is Lysanidae. I said that correctly I think so it's always tough with them um, with insects because there seem to be so many varieties of them now you can see that these butterflies are moving their wings up and down up and down and they'll often do this to catch the Sun this is a large surface area to absorb the sunlight and and they'll also do this to kind of warm up their wings and you can see that the proboscis is out on the one of them, I just saw it. There you go. You can see that the proboscis is out and it's searching in amongst those little cracks for bits of water. A really beautiful looking butterfly. Oh, this one's got tatty wings. Shame. Poor guy. Well, it wouldn't affect his flight too much, we hope. Now these wings are, have a whole lot of scales on them and these scales sort of come off as dust on your fingers. You would have seen when you maybe catch a butterfly or a moth that this dust sort of comes off onto your fingers. And those scales provides them with color and reflection and it's also a really neat trick because if they fly into a spider's web, well mostly a spider's web, or anything else that's sticky and uncomfortable, they can leave those scales behind and escape pretty much unscathed. Ah, James Richard, thank you so much. You said that these butterflies are called jokers. Oh, I can't imagine why. I suppose maybe they're funny amongst themselves. Very, very pretty. Now, I did think that jokers kind of had little bits of, or little ends to their tail. Uh, well, not to their tail, to their hind wings. Little bits that point out. But I suppose it's hard to tell when you don't have them up close. But thank you very much, James Richard. I was actually surprised that they were here where it seems to be quite dry t for us. This little wallow seems to be quite dry, but to them, they obviously can pick up little minuscule bits of water that's still trapped in there. Remember that in pans like this that have been dried up, all the minerals are still logged in there. So it could be mineral rich and that's what they're trying to get out of it as well. Very cool. And you'll notice that butterflies, when they're at rest, will have both their wings sort of above their head, held high. Whereas with moths at rest, they'd both be held down to the ground.
Very cute. Oh, there seems to be something else flying about there too. Where did I see it? It's quite interesting how they all sort of come together at these spots. You would have seen it with those African vagrants as well. Where they all kind of just come together in this communal spot, hang about. I've noticed it around water quite a bit. Now we're talking about communication. Lauren's been speaking to you about communication. And when it comes to butterflies, they also communicate in quite an interesting way. They use pheromones, just like lots of animals do. But they kind of leave a pheromone trail as they go about. And if you've seen two butterflies sort of following each other through the air, it's actually the one one butterfly, the male usually, following a female and smelling her scent and trying to figure out if she is ready to mate or not. So communication exists in all kinds of ways. It even happens in color. Especially with insects, they communicate well with color. Guri, you'd like to know how do butterflies mate? Hopefully we'll see. No, nobody looks like they're in the mating mode. So the way that they mate is sort of they'll attach to one another. I mean, in the usual way, but the male will fly with the female. And it's quite a strange thing to watch. He'll sort of like a crane keeps her in flight with him and he'll fly with her. They're sort of bum to bum, if that makes sense. If I see one around, I will stop and show you. I've seen a few lately in the last couple weeks, in the last couple weeks. Very cool. I like them. Thank you, James Richards, for identifying exactly which ones they are. I think they're quite cool. So we're feeling very lucky today, Craig and I. I always tell him in this car, there's no you and me, it's us, Craig. We'll do this. We're going to find some interesting things. So we're still here in the West. After those ostriches, I feel a little pumped. Yes, I do. I do. Let's see what other exciting, unusual things we might find around the area. That track was quite interesting, don't you think so? I have not seen anything like it. Now, I know that they have those, that really long middle toe, but I didn't expect it to be that long because that looked really, really long. But I wonder if as they walk, they kind of kick forward because lots of animals do do that as they walk, including leopards and lions, as the, their tracks can sort of, the sand can be pushed in the front of them. But that was really interesting. Ah, I see Jimmy has caught up with Tandy. Good on him. He's been doing so well these last few days. So let's go over to him. managed to get round uh, to the side of Tandy and um, yeah, it's quite a nice view, a glint of sun in her eyes and she seems quite relaxed, she's on the edge of a mound to try and get some elevation for whatever she saw earlier, still haven't seen anything but she might have sensed something that we haven't, um, she's been moving quite slowly through this area um, so we're going to stay with her as long as we can it's, uh, it gets a little bit more open if she goes west from here which would if she heads north it gets a bit thicker I think so we definitely listening to something I think 
she's also appreciating a bit of shade. It still hasn't really started cooling down yet. See the twitch of ears occasionally. So they blend in in this shaded, shaded light. They really dapple in and dappled shade is probably where they most uh, camouflaged. Brendan, how, that question again, how, what were litters? Litters of of leopard cubs. If, uh, how rare are leopards? Uh, how rare are leopards? Sorry, um, they actually m more common than um, one thinks. But it's because they are normally shy and elusive animals, um, and generally preferring and being more successful in dense vegetation, um, uh, thicker vegetation. Um, but we're fortunate here in that we can keep a track of them because they've, they are um, more habituated. Um, but they, they, they not uh, rare as in um, some, you know, for example, a black leopard. Um, that would be how I would be classif classify the black leopard as rare. So. They're not rare, but they're not always easy to find, especially in areas that aren't, um, don't have leopards that are um, habituated to to vehicles or, or um, someone tracking them, for example. See that low, low head? She's now looking below something, so she's still looking out at something. We're definitely going to sit with her for a bit. Uh, she looks more active than she was yesterday. And uh, send you over to Lauren with a cat of another kind. Okay, we have just arrived here to a pride of lions. I'm not 100% who they are right now, but let me just brief you on what is happening. We have a very large hippo in the distance that some of the lions have been looking at, and indeed one lioness went into full stock mode and she is currently eyeing up a warthog. So there's lots of things happening. This is a lioness who went into stock mode. Now she's gone flat on the ground, but it's got a lot cooler here and something is definitely picking up the interest of these lions. Now let us just show you that hippo right in the background there. There we go. It's obviously came out of the water and started foraging. And indeed to the other side, to the far, far right, we do have a warthog who is seemingly unaware that there's a lot of lions here, but acting a little bit nervous. Doesn't seem to know they're here, but seems to know that potentially something is wrong. We've got another lioness looking. They're all staring in the one direction here. And I'm just wondering if the temperature is getting just right. I don't need to fully be an expert in visual communication to know that these dark clouds up ahead are signaling rain. It's now very cool and it seems that the... Oh. Did you hear that? That was thunder. I don't know why I'm whispering, but that was thunder. 
Okay, we've got a lot. We've got one, two, three, four of the lions now gazing intently in the direction of the warthog. And indeed, there's some Thompson's gazelle here and some impala right off in the distance. So that is indeed the direction that they're facing. Now, we did arrive on the scene and we were indeed told by the ranger that this is the marsh pride. However, there's a lot of confusion within this area surrounding this pride. Now, this could indeed be the river pride also. Now, what happens out in the Mara is it's different organisations sometimes give different animals or different prides or different clans different names and it does get a little bit confusing so I don't want to say anything just yet until I can properly ID who these lions are before I make a confirmation but we've just arrived look at that <laughs> look at the waves oh gorgeous and they're just oh it's a family of warthogs it's not just one warthog i can see three or is that four i think this is indeed what is attracting the lion's attention they've all got up they've all stirred no one's sleeping anymore four yeah there you go four warthogs seems to be what they're all staring at but indeed, warthogs are equipped. They're actually very fast and they're equipped with their own weapons sticking out their head. So it's not an easy feat to go for a warthog. You have to be rather specialized to do that. But they're moving off in the opposite direction now. They're too nervous here. They know that indeed something is wrong. And of course, all our lions are out in front of us right now and they're awake. They do look like they could potentially get up and move any moment. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight that we can see at the moment. And there are definitely a lot more alert than we first heard. When we first heard about these lions, we got told very flat cats sound asleep. And I can assure you, these are not flat cats anymore. They are alert. One lioness is watching something off in the distance here. Let me just get my binos. Talking of vision and vision clues, there's another warthog, a different one. I definitely do need to get my eyes tested at some point. Luckily, I have binoculars. This is asking about lions' reaction to people in cars. Now, it's such an interesting question, and as I answer it, I'm just going to keep my very own eyes on these lions because they are indeed really starting to stir. And they're... Oh, I will come back to it. This lioness is moving forward. This is the one whose interest was initially first peaked and everyone else seemed to stir after her. Yeah, they are very interested in something. They're now going in the opposite direction to where that other warthog ran. Warthog ran. <laughs> Get on my words, jump up. Hmm. I'm just watching them all. They're definitely, definitely interested in something. And the reason they're not interested in vehicles or people within vehicles is they are very accustomed to vehicles. And there's lots and lots of studies done on this that they don't recognize humans in vehicles. They recognize the object as a whole. So the whole... What are you up to, girl? Oh, we've got some more lions behind us. Unfortunately, Bungay is not going to be able to capture them, I don't think, because of the way they're we are positioned. But indeed, I don't want to move the car right at this moment. Oh, there you go. This lioness is walking towards two more. Right off in the distance, there's two. Oh, 
they're all going off on their own little separate missions here. It's going to be difficult to keep my eyes on them. But just to wrap up that question, yes, yeah, so animals, especially predators, are said to see the vehicle as a whole. Non-threatening, of course, unless they are injured by vehicles, then of course they will have a completely different reaction. However, they're not able to identify, oh, there's three humans sitting on this vehicle. It doesn't work like that. So indeed, they don't seem to be threatened by vehicles. There is a distance limit here in the Mara and of course we respect that this lioness is running off somewhere Bungay up ahead they're all running off everywhere this one you see her I can't see where she's going though and we've got lions right in front of it oh. I'm not sure we would be able to follow her there anyway these lions are hungry I think I can confirm that much yeah it's the warthog off in the distance they're going after the warthog right off in the distance where I'm probably not going to be able to see. Okay, shall we move forward? Shall we try and move forward? We've got lions on either side though. This might not be possible. And unfortunately, we've just not got a great view because we have a lioness about seven meters from the car right now. I can't believe that she got up and she actually went after a warthog. She's just gone behind that bush. Now we just have to be very careful right now because there we go. She's off right into the distance there. She went on her own little mission alone after that lone warthog. Incredible. Now, of course, we cannot drive into the thick vegetation there anyway, which is why where she has disappeared. But my predicament was, if we can just see, there's a lioness here, and I do not indeed want to drive and block that lioness's vision. And then we have two right here. So for me to drive forward like that would indeed be irresponsible as far as I am concerned. So, oh, we've got a rainbow. Nicely spotted, Bungay. I wonder if we can capture it for you. Can you just see the start of that rainbow there? It's really beautiful where we are and indeed it goes right over the lions. I wonder where the pot of gold is. Wow, incredible. Okay, so the other lions don't appear to be moving. It just seemed to be one lioness who did go off on her own little mission there. Now we've got other vehicles appearing and about four lions behind us. So this situation is indeed becoming more and more interesting. Bogdo's asking, I think, about storms affecting lions' behaviour. I hope I've got that right. For some reason, I'm not able to understand Mina 100%, but I hope that was the question. And indeed, weather will affect the animals because it can actually give predators an added advantage. Sorry, I'm just watching what's going on. I'm trying to multitask here. <laughs> There's a lot going on behind me. So indeed, the predators can make use of the fact that it's windy. Oh, here she comes. Look at her coming back. Okay, she, she obviously wasn't successful. Something piqued her interest, but it obviously was not a successful attempt. But she's making her way back towards us and the rest of the pride. So yes, predators can actually use it to their advantage because I've actually been talking about communication, haven't I? So it goes back to that. When it's really, really windy, of course, prey species, especially antelopes, will not be able to rely on their hearing. It will also be dark. And most of the prey that lions go after is indeed diurnal animals that rely heavily on visual communication during the day so when it becomes dark of course they cannot see these lions have got the advantage of having special eyes and special retina that is adapted to seeing during the during the night time which the prey species would not have so if we were talking about lions they would indeed you'd use the weather to their advantage because prey could potentially not hear them not see them and not catch their scent what are you doing girl 
am not 100% sure what indeed this lioness is up to, but she's got bundles of energy. There's another lioness coming out of the bushes here as well. And indeed, the rain is starting to fall. Not too heavy yet. I really hope it doesn't get that heavy, but it is indeed starting to fall on us. So I do wonder if the lions are going to become more and more active. So yes, storms will affect the animals, but not necessarily in a negative way. Animals live out here. This is their home. Of course, they can survive weather conditions. So I do believe we might have to put our rain covers on very shortly, but we will decide that while we send you back down to Trishala looking for animals. Yes, well, in Juma, we're not having very much rain at all, unfortunately, but it seems like the next two days might be a bit cooler and maybe we can expect some rain, which would be lovely for all the animals and for us, really. We need a break from this heat. So I am on the western boundary right now, and I like driving this road, even though it is the camera killer road. I like driving it because it's really productive and Shadulu is often found just walking up and down this road. So always have my eye out for her. Sometimes she just pops out and there she is. So considering our good luck with the ostriches, Maybe we'll have good luck with Shududu too. It's also much cooler on this road because the sun is now on that side. So the shadow of all these bushes are being cast on us. Mina Mu, you'd like to know why leopards are so solitary? Oh, that's sort of the niche that they have taken if you think about all the animals that are in sort of well of, firstly there's a number of reasons let me start with this one all animals fill a certain niche within this ecological environment and there has to be or there must have been a niche for animals that are hidden and are ambush predators as opposed to something that just runs after things so there's point number one they fill some sort of ecological niche that allows them or needs them to be hidden and solitary. Secondly, they are everywhere. In fact, I think the only environment that they can't survive in is true desert. Everywhere else they pretty much can survive in. And also being solitary means that you can avoid certain sort of I suppose liabilities of living in a group such as members being left behind having to look after sick or tired or I don't know injured members and then also when you're looking for food you don't have to share it with anybody now that all fits into the first point of fitting a certain niche so there's they've evolved in a way that meant that their, their choice or their ability to be alone has benefited them. Whereas with a lion, the ability to be in a, in a pride or together has benefited them. So it's very much about what, how they've evolved. But I think the most important thing is the fact that you wouldn't have to share your meals with any other members and not have to be concerned with them but that being said lions that do hunt in, in their in their numbers dogs as well wild dogs they make a higher percentage of kills so they're more likely to actually find food but the difference is they're going to have to share that food so that's quite a loaded question there's a lot of things to think about why animals develop in a certain way and it does have a lot to do with their evolution so I'm also just looking for tracks Nina you were asking about Shudura Luna, you are asking about Shadulu and I think a scar. 
but I, I cannot really hear very well. It might be because I'm on this end and comms are breaking up just a little bit for me. Hopefully Nina would... Ah, there we go. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for clearing up. Luna, you'd like to know what is Shidulu? Shidulu is a female leopard that's on our property, or at least part of our property. And she has two little cubs at the moment. Shidulu means termite mound. And she was named after it because she's often found on top of termite mounds. I think that she was born in 2014 or 15 in the spring. I will double check that for you just now. But she is a wonderful leopard and she has these two little bundles of joy that uh, seem to be in tow most of the time. We've only seen her once with the cubs, but other vehicles and on other properties have seen her as well. So we know that they're well and healthy and it's just a matter of finding them. Up ahead there. Let's go have a look. We think we have spotted something on the road. Let's see. Also keeping an eye out for tracks, but the problem with a road like this is it's because it's so so well driven on tracks can often be obliterated quite easily i also need to keep an eye up into the trees and we will see what we find ah, ah i see up ahead okay so while we get into great and uh, better position it's not schedule it seems to be a little baby ellie let's go to jimmy to give you a bit of an update on tandy we've um just cut around to a little track and uh, she still was moving she's static in here and we just heard a, a, an impala bark to our um to our north so we're gonna go back and see if she moves in front of us <laughs> so in the i think not whether they sure they picked up on her scent or not or Okay, what have we got there? Yeah, I think she's... Yeah, she's coming straight towards us here. So I'm going to move back a bit. And she should cross in front of us here. <coughs> Jeez, the light's not... Got her? There we go. Definitely, she definitely heard that impala bark. You can see that she's now trying to pinpoint the position of them. See, 
beautiful posture, typical cat posture there. Sniffing the air a bit, you see that head raised slightly. Kimberly, good question. No, we don't have black leopards in this area, but um, up towards the Drakensberg Mountains, there have been records very um, few records but records nevertheless of black leopard up um, on the in the high felt region of the Drakensberg but in the um, in this province um, but certainly not common at all remains we've got two lioness who have just spotted the warthogs i think it is the same family walking directly towards them i can feel the tension it's in the air one lioness is very visible on the mound so she's just frozen watching them but one lioness has spotted them and she's actually gone in to the vegetation to begin her stocking so we've tried to position ourselves to get a view of everything because these lionesses are hungry and they're up to something and one of them was very focused on this warthog family i feel like they're not entirely too sure oh, wow we've got some lightning in the sky now I don't know where that lioness is that went off into the thicket. She's there. She's watching them. But I think she needed them to come a little bit closer, and they're not. So this is a visible one. Look at that body posture. Communication right within itself there. You can tell this lion is trying not to move, not to attract any tension. She's got her body low to the ground, but she's alert. She's watching these warthogs very, very intently. I just can't see where the other lioness went. Okay, the warthogs are moving closer. I don't think they're aware they're walking into lions. I really don't. Now this lioness on the mound must stay still because the warthogs are nervous. But they are indeed walking right in the direction of all of these lions. Now they're very separated. So I honestly don't know what's going to happen here. I want the warthogs to get a little bit closer. See how cautious they are. They're really not sure, and I don't know what it is that's making them unsure. But they definitely haven't spotted the lions. Now, there's lions everywhere to my left and to my right, and there is indeed two. Yep, the warthogs are walking closer. They're walking right towards that lioness. right towards her. Now lions are master stalkers but indeed it's all about the timing and it's all about getting it right and making sure the prey is within the correct distance. So this is risky. A warthog would be a perfect snack but the lioness has got to get it right. Now, they're very, very interested whether they're actually going to go for these warthogs or not. I'm really not sure. But I can tell you... Oh, okay, they've changed direction. They have completely changed their direction and they're walking off. Look at that. They're skipping off. 
I wonder if they knew something was wrong. You can see the young just trying to keep up with the adults there. Man, that was so close. Jessica's asking, are these lions likely, I've got my rain covers on by the way, likely to go after the baby warthogs? And indeed, that is the most tricky thing. I'm just keeping my eyes on this lioness here because that is the one that was having a look. And Jessica, indeed, I'm not sure. They've been watching these warthogs very intently in full stock mode for quite some time now. Now, lioness can also hunt on their own. They don't need their pride. I'm just going to reposition the car here. If they wish, they can indeed hunt on their own. And maybe that's exactly what that lioness was planning on doing. Maybe she was just hungry and she saw a perfect opportunity. So there we go. We've got all these lions in front of us. I'm just going to go forward a bit. So Jessica, I don't know, but they were definitely stalking without a word of a doubt and they're definitely hungry. So indeed, if a warthog presented itself, I don't see why the lioness would not take that opportunity if the opportunity was indeed the right one. Now, all the lioness are in front of us right now and we've got more coming in from the left. So I hope we don't lose sight of them because they're definitely all up to something. And again, this is a perfect example about what I've been talking about. They're constantly in visual reach with one another. They constantly keep looking at one another. They've not made any sounds. I haven't heard any verbal communication. But these pride members, this one looks a bit stiff, doesn't it? It's a bit of a stiff walk there. But they're remaining within visual distance of one another. They know exactly where each other are. And indeed, they pick up on each other's cues, if you like. So when one lioness does get hungry and something piques her interest, the other lioness tend to follow suit. Joy's asking a question that I know I should be able to answer, but right now I probably can. How many lions have we spotted? Now, I saw at least 10, but we keep seeing more coming in. And this is what is confusing me. So right now in front of us, we do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But there were definitely eight. There definitely was more than that. So again... I haven't confirmed which pride this is. Definitely not the Olololos, for sure. But within this marsh pride and river pride confusion, I am really not sure. Now, the ranger did say the marsh pride, but I do feel this is the river pride. But before we make any confirmation on who these lions are, I do need to do some more investigation. I just can't take my eyes off them right now. I hope they don't wander in to the deep vegetation where we will lose sight of them. I really hope they don't. But they're definitely on a mission somewhere. Now, lioness can get very stressed when they're separated. So they will sometimes wander off. Lioness are known to go off with males, for example, and sort of lose sight of their pride. And when they're rejoining their pride, they will contact call. They will use a lot of calling to find one another. And indeed, lioness can go off and hunt on their own. They can. They're strong enough and more than capable enough to do that. And whether they would go after a warthog indeed would present on the situation itself. Now a warthog, an adult warthog, does indeed contain a lot of meat. It would be the perfect snack for a lioness if she was on her own. Now I say snack. <laughs> but of course, warthogs are not an easy prey to catch. Now some of our leopards down in Juma are obviously experts at it but warthogs could indeed really harm a lioness. So I'm really not sure if she would indeed go for that. I think those lioness were hoping that the warthogs would walk right towards them, but indeed they didn't, they changed their direction. Otherwise, I do think that lioness would have went for one of the warthogs. Look at them all just listening. 
sensing what is going on around them and the thunder is rumbling and the dark clouds are indeed rolling in. So bad weather is on its way. I, of course, am prepared with my rain covers. The drizzling has stopped, so we didn't need to put the rain covers on the vehicle, but I have indeed put one on myself just in case. So the weather is changing and the lions are probably very much picking up on it. And maybe that is what is waking them up. Now that was a tense situation watching the warthogs get closer and closer and obviously they made the right decision to indeed go the other way. But where we are right now is very close to Kichwa Airstrip and it is indeed where Busara was residing for quite some time. Now interestingly enough, after the Olololo and River Pride clash, which was with Patrick and it was a very hard sighting for everyone to watch, Busara has since not been sighted since then and it is my first belief that she has indeed gone far away from all the lions and all that commotion. Got another lioness coming to join the others. They do like to be close to one another, lions. They do enjoy being social and they do enjoy contact with one another, especially lions within a pride. That is one beautiful lioness. Get the spots on the underbelly and the legs. Stunning. So the Olololos and the River Pride territories meet. So obviously territories are fluid, but indeed the sort of boundaries of the two prides do clash. And that is indeed what happened the other day. So my feeling is that this is indeed the River Pride, but I will check up on that right now and get back to you. So indeed, I am not the only one looking for spots. I have my spots in the form of lions, but Trishala is still looking for hers. I have also got some spots, so my search for Shadulu has turned up nothing at all, but I made my way back down and I found myself at the hyena den. You know, it's like a magnet. It just pulls me in. So it is fairly active at the moment. We've got two adults around. We've got Ribbon, who you're looking at right there. You can see the nick in her ear. Hey, Ribbon girl. Passed out. <laughs> She did lift her head when we came in. And we've also got the big corks. There she is. Hey, corky. Also knocked out flat. And there we've got one of Pretty's cubs. Looking quite big, I must say. Nice and fluffy. Jamie's always told us that they go through a phase where they get really, really fluffy when they're kind of just coming out of cubhood almost. Or the normal very protective stages where they're still hanging about by the den all the time and this is kind of where pretty's cubs are at at the moment because they're mooching about all over the place i saw them crossing the road the other day in the evening <laughs> so they've definitely grown a lot so shaggy and so sleepy it's a very sleepy day out here in juma Now, Corky is around, so I wonder where Plonky is. She's showing us a nice view of those pads of her feet. So you can see exactly where those tracks come from. You can see that the each toe... They're nice and kidney-shaped, those toes. Kind of like puzzle pieces. As opposed to little round dots like the leopard. And you can see the two lobes on the pad, also unlike the leopard. Cool. You can also see the, the little nails coming off. Corky, do you need a spa day? Brennan, a really interesting question there. You'd like to know what the laughing means for hyenas. Now, you'd be probably familiar with the fact that hyenas do laugh, or some of them 
at some point in their life will be laughing away. For example, Corky here does not do a lot, a lot of laughing because laughing is something that indicates nervousness or subordinance almost. And you'll find that very nervous hyenas or ner um, hyenas that are very low ranking when they approach other high ranking hyenas, especially at a, at a kill, they'll start to giggle this sort of maniacal kind of cackle. Oh, there you go, I rhymed. Hello. And that sort of giggle indicates being nervous and unsure and wanting to be submissive to the other hyenas around it. So it's not the typical sound. The typical sound is, of course, the whoop. Whoop. Goes something like that. I've even heard these little guys doing a mini whoop. It goes whoop, whoop. It's the cutest thing. You'll often hear them squittering, which sounds like kind of like your puppy does. And I didn't actually hear them do the little whoop before, but then I heard it and I thought that is the cutest thing. Fast asleep. But you'll notice that they're never quite totally asleep. Well, I can't speak for Ribbon here who looks absolutely knocked out. I mean, Ribbon hasn't budged. Do I even see her nose dripping there? <laughs> it is. Oh, it's a proper drooly sleep. Luna, you'd like to know if Ribbon is low ranking? Well, it's sort of difficult to sort out rank below matriarch. Now, we know for sure that Corky is matriarch, and we do know that I think it was pretty. Used to be quite high ranking, but then suddenly it fell. Now you'd be able to tell by the interactions with each other just how high ranking they are. And now Corky sort of overthrew the uh, previous matriarch, which was I think Madam, and Pretty, which cub, whose cub is around here, above Corky. There we go, that's Pretty's cub. Pretty was actually the daughter of Madam, or possibly, most likely, the daughter of Madam. So she would have been next in line, if that makes sense. And she used to kind of be very high ranking, but then something happened and she dropped in her rank. And I always say dropped in her rank. That's something that you can see quite easily when they interact and you can see who lifts up there their leg first for the greeting, whose head is down in a submissive kind of way. And as for Ribbon, who we are speaking about, she has kind of always just been... Oh, Cox, lifting up your head. Ribbon, you're also stirring. She has always kind of been in the middle from what I can gather. I didn't don't imagine that she was ever very high ranking, but the fact that she is denning here with June and her cubs means that possibly they're on the same level. But when Corky comes into the show and thrown into the mix, it is no, there's no doubt at all about her status. Flop back down. Hey, Corky, Corky's gone a bit alert. I think she can hear a vehicle going by and she's just lifted up her head. Very cool. Look at the two of them. It's like mini me. Next to each other, both with the ears up, both ears moving side to side, listening around. Very, very cute. Ah, there seems to be someone else coming in. And now, if there are cubs around, which there are, there is someone else coming in, then I will move off and give them an opportunity to view them as well. So while I do that, why don't I send you over to Jimmy to give you a small update on what Tandy's been doing. We've managed to stay with her. And, uh... 
actually nearly lost us in this thick stuff. Now, if you can see, it's pretty much all you can see is a little white tip of her tail. Um, she's definitely heard something to the north of her, to our left, and uh, we're going to try and get a little bit closer, but I don't want, I'm going to try and get parallel to her. to be moving in both directions. We had had a little had a hyena that was following her a little while ago. But seems to have moved off. So she's more relaxed now. But uh having seems to be having a short rest. Um but certainly alert nonetheless. Look at that amazing camouflage in this brown grass. Taking the advantage of having a rest before she moves into action again. <laughs> seen Shudulu um, a while ago and yes um, I haven't seen I haven't seen Shudulu often but I have seen I have seen uh, Shudulu yes The leopard, uh, the leopards in Lon Lozi that I was most familiar with was the um, leopard, which we called the old mother. So she was one of the first habituated leopards at Lon Lozi, and then she had a um, had a female cub um, called the Tuguan female, um, which frequented a big drainage. Uh, dry riverbed south of her position and she was um, quite a lot bigger than her mother and had quite a temperament um, quite an aggressive female although would allow you in her s space but she certainly let you know that uh, you were close enough a bit like um, a bit like this female um, but she s seemed to be a bit bigger than than Tundi I think she's really probably taking advantage of uh, the light dropping now um, because that will benefit her more as it gets a bit darker. She's been moving quite a lot. I mean, she, we, we've, she was found in the heat of the day moving, so she's uh, moved quite a distance in the heat. So she's certainly making the most of this temperature cooling down now um, now she stays alert even though she's uh, looks like she's sleeping, her 
her senses are always ready to be pricked up um, and that's obviously how they survive in these environments oh here's hyena that's what she heard hyena's just sneaked in and has picked up her scent in fact I wonder if there's not more than one hyena there's a hyena coming to our from our right towards her there we go so there we go you can see how she picked that up long before I heard anything um, so watch the watch this watch this this is phen uh, phenomenal she's probably going to give it a bit of a charge and then dash off I would imagine look at her tail I don't think the hyena's even seen her I must have seen I can't believe this he hasn't seen it he's heard it something but he hasn't he's gonna walk straight <laughs> I can't believe it. they're literally two meters apart if he starts moving away she will just lie low because she doesn't want to attract his attention back mm -hmm. this is quite a big female this by the looks of it looks like she's lactating <laughs> crazy resting again from absolute alertness and tension to to slumber <laughs> well let's wait for the next hyena <laughs> that was that was some interesting behavior and action definitely going to sit around with her and uh, while we do that and she takes a nap we're going to send you to Lauren in the Masai Mara Oh Tandy and her beautiful smile I do miss her but most of all I miss Corky please do tell my Corks I miss her now, the lion saga is just continuing. Lionesses are coming out of everywhere. And of course, we are losing light very fast. Didn't have much of a sunset tonight because of all the clouds, but indeed we have gone on to IR infrared because we are losing light and we want to keep track of all these lions because indeed they're all up to something. Now, the warthogs did a huge loop a ginormous loop all the way round and they have indeed disappeared into the bushes but the lioness's interest was still very much peaked. There's two lioness that appear very skinny shall we say on the hungry side and they're definitely definitely interested in something but me being a human and inadequate I indeed cannot pick up on what it is. I do not have the hearing of a lion or the eyesight of a lion but some oh is that the warthog's head hold on yes it is it is okay the warthogs are up ahead now they're far off but what these lioness have done have actually gone into the thicket hoping that the warthogs are going to come back around i think and now we just have the most terrible view of all let's just wait and see where this little family of warthogs go if they decide to go round, then they could be in some trouble. Right in that bush that you can just see to your left is a whole gang of lions. Let's just wait and see if the warthogs pass through here. The camera can definitely pick up more than I can right now. 
They're in there. They're waiting. The warthogs, for some reason, want to continue on their original plan. But yet, there's a whole lot of lions. Okay, so we got more lioness on the move here. And they're all heading towards this one bush. It's all happening inside this thicket. There we go. Now we know it's not the perfect view, but we are a little bit far and we are using our infrared light. This is the perfect time, the perfect temperature for the lions indeed to get up. It's cooler, it's getting darker. Their advantage of having that special layer in their eye called the tapetum lucidum which double backs the reflection of light so they get it twice on their retina and it obviously helps them see much better in the night many nocturnal animals have this even including sharks in the ocean it is not just a land-based thing they're all making the way in towards this bush which is so unfortunate for us because of course we cannot drive into the bush I would if I could however I feel these ladies and there are a few sub-adult males are going to hunt it is hunting time oh she's off she's off where are you going girl can you hear that Okay, they've all ran off in the one direction. I can hear lots of vocalizations. And unfortunately, my vision is the bush. There's definitely something going on behind that bush right now. And unfortunately, we are not able to get any closer. What shall we do? I think we're gonna wait it out. There's a warthog. Walking right into the lions. Oh, how frustrating. If only we could see exactly what was going on in front of us. But all these lions are after something. I think I'm just going to stay put here for now. Maybe go a little bit further forward. And indeed, I think the lions will come back with something. So let me just go a little bit further forward. Although it doesn't take us any closer, I'm afraid. But possibly we can get a better view this way of what these lions are indeed up to. So difficult to see. I do not have nocturnal eyes. But I think they chased the warthog, or at least one of them. Now the land is very marshy here because of all the rains. I can't see anything just yet. Oh wait. Can you see anything, Bungay? Okay, something's happening and it always happens just as we're losing light. Now let's just take a scan and see if we can see anything. We'll use the camera, of course, because that's way more equipped for it than I am. Anything at all? Nope. Lions, where did you go? Indeed, they have disappeared. All of those lions, how on earth can you just disappear from us like that? That is incredible. Of course, they've obviously gone into the bushes and I really do think they were chasing right after. Okay. <laughs> that indeed does look like a very relaxed lioness. <laughs> One that is indeed not hunting or stalking. There you go. Everyone else seems to have disappeared. But we do have one lioness rolling around in the grass, which was not what I expected. Oh, here we go. Here's the other one. So you can just see by that body language off into the bushes. This lioness is indeed on a mission of some sort. We just have no idea what that is. So while we try and figure all of this out, let's send you back down to Miss Tandy herself. We've stuck.
stuck with her and followed her back towards the drainage line and luckily for us she took up into this marula tree um, seems to be resting in this marula now and so it's going to be worth sticking with her she's definitely <laughs> got up here to see if there was uh, to get an elevation and watch um, she was looking out as we got uh, closer to her she uh, seems to be having another snooze in the tree for now so we're going to reposition so we can maybe get a bit more of a bit more um, of a better angle on her so just stay with us folks while we move and then also if she comes down we might be in a better position for her when she comes down good from here. Good? Yeah. There we go, Sip. Nice side on of her in the tree. And give her a full view of her. Can't see if her eyes are open or closed from here. Closed, so he's having a little nap up in the tree now. Ah, oh, beautiful. I'm gonna zoom out and show you how stunning is that. No, absolutely. Nice uh, pastel sky behind her. And I think if she comes down, we might be in quite a good position to get her side on. Um, hopefully not, not behind the tree. She's heard something again. I wonder if it's not another hyena. See how her senses just are always on tune. The hyena that was around her earlier ran off or moved off steadily and uh, sort of gave up <laughs> I don't think he even saw her typical leopard pose Lisa certainly does look comfortable she's found a fantastic perch up in this marula and I don't think you can get better than that supporting her back legs um, it's a beautiful horizontal branch for her there's a nice wide showing you the terrain we're in um, it's typical marula light marula woodland um, and she's luckily moved out of the thicker stuff um, so we managed to stay with her, fortunately. Uh, Heather, um, territorial, are leopards as territorial as lions? Most definitely. Um, Leopard uh, females and males will mark territory. So what normally happens is a male might have, uh, depending on area, which uh, areas they're in, might have three and three to four females within its territory. So he has to control that area to um, keep m other males coming into its area. And lion do the same. So the male. The male lions would uh, do the same with uh, prides and m uh, male lions would often um, keep territory for one, two, sometimes three different prides. So it's a similar behavior but on a much larger scale for lions. 
leopard territories, the females would mark an area in, in, in this low felt region. They have uh, approximately a 30 square kilometer territory and males up to 90 square kilometer territory. Whereas the lions, uh, sorry, the male leopard, 90 square kilometers, whereas the lion could cover, um, big male lions could cover a couple of hundred square kilometers that they'd have to um, control and, and uh, um, dominate over. And how they would, how, how they would uh, control that territory is by um, moving on its boundaries and um, marking with urine, uh, scratching the ground, uh, spreading the scent on its feet and, and transmitting the scent wider than just the, the urine patch. And often they would uh, keep their tail up and uh, urinate onto bushes. Um, and both leopard and lion do that. And then also vocal, so they would roar to keep uh, nomadic males out of their territory. Um, so they vocal and scent. birds starting to settle down there's a few birds in the background calling gently settling down for the evening um, might be lucky enough to get the odd owl calling she looks pretty settled for now we're gonna see what Lauren is up to with those lions might have a bit more action than we do right now. So we'll send you to Lauren. Indeed, our lions did just appear just out of our reach. They were on a mission. What interesting behavior we have indeed watched tonight. This is a very cohesive pride. And that is, of course, what prides are all about. But they were very much working together they are on some sort of mission but we indeed fail to figure out what it was but that was a wonderful interaction and of course jimmy was just telling you about leopards and their sort of territorial behavior with lions and although both leopards and lions are very closely related they're both panthera indeed their sort of lifestyle, their spatial tactics and their social tactics are very different. I think Trishala mentioned earlier that leopards are solitary. They spend their lives completely alone, unless mating, of course, and unless having cubs. They're solitary animals, solitary cats. So they have to communicate in a completely different way than lions would when they're social. So they have the same fundamental ways of communicating, but their behavior is gonna be very different. For a male lion, oh, here we go, sorry, just changing my gears there. For a male lion who will indeed spend time with a pride that is receptive to him and they will spend time in a coalition. You have to remember that a leopard, oh, I don't know what's going on with my gearbox here tonight, are on their own. So even although it is the same fundamental behaviors between the cats, olfactory cues, scent marking, calling, tingana saws, lion's roar, obviously they completely have different lifestyles and I just think that's indeed very, very fascinating. Leopards territories, females and males indeed overlap. And obviously for lions out here, it's completely different social behaviors. They are far more social. They're said to be the only social cat out here in Africa because they do have these cohesive prides. And of course, I think you can use the word cohesive for the coalitions as well, actually. The males are quite they can be actually very tender in their social bonds with one another. And coalitions do separate, they do come back together again, but essentially they work together. They socialize and they can even hunt and kill together. So it's completely different behaviors, which I think is indeed very, very fascinating. 
Now we are just making our way out of this area and the lightning and the thunder is continuing on to the side of us here right above our camp so I'm not sure our journey home is going to be an enjoyable one however for the time being we are indeed dry what an afternoon it has been from elephants to giraffes to lions all talking about communication along the way and indeed of course I am fascinated with communication in the ocean as well and indeed it's a whole different medium being suspended in water how on earth do you communicate now believe it or not fish can actually make a huge array of sounds even more than some vertebrates and mammals out here and they do say that hearing did first come from the water that is one of the theories and of course fish may appear silent but indeed they are not now you have to remember that sound travels five times faster in the water so i think it's effective to say that fish do use their hearing a lot more than you think they would now i'm just going to get out of this area that we are in which could be a bit tricky so while we do that we will send you back down to trishala Yes, well, speaking of hearing, there's lots of animals around here that have great, great hearing. And you can see it from the size of their massive ears, like a kudu. Kudus have these huge ears. And the wild dog's ears, those are really, really striking. So you can tell that hearing is such a great advantage. Of course, there's some animals that you can barely see ears and they kind of have just little holes in the sides of their heads like reptiles like lizards they have those type of inner ears and not not much else externally well speaking of reptiles i'll tell you my fun fact for the day on this day in 1989 a 150 million year old dinosaur egg was discovered and that was really important because for a long time there had been a gap in the fossil record in that 100, 100 million year sort of section so that was the first time that they had found a dinosaur egg with an embryo still inside it and i think that's really cool so on this day it was published in science so that's a journal on the 31st of march 1989 and that sort of egg that a reptile would produce well they called amniotes which is basically basically most of us it's mammals reptiles and birds produce a kind of egg with separate little bits and it has different parts to it you have the amnion which is the actual liquid that the fetus sits in and that's an adaptation from being in the sea for a long time or things having evolved from creatures in the sea because it was so important that that fetus wouldn't dry out so then that adaptation became quite important to have that body of water in you now so is the amnion and then you also have the chorion which is the part of the egg where the gas exchange happens and that's a really cool part in a hyena because in a hyena that is very similar to our own and that's the part of the placenta that does gas exchange and in the hyena it's very very similar to our own and sometimes i wonder if that their sort of robustness when they're born is a result of having that really thin layer so lots of gas can be exchanged between the mum and the fetus there's also the allantois said in a strange way i might have said it incorrectly but i'm sure it's an allantois and that is the part of the egg where waste gets taken away or stored and with reptiles it's usually stored in the form of uric acid and that's because it if it's stored as urine like it is within us 
then they're wasting water that they could have used in other ways. So they actually store it as little crystals of uric acid, which I find really cool. And then of course you have the yolk sac. And the yolk sac is where the fetus is getting all of its nutrients from. So there you go, dinosaur egg, 150 million years ago, and now you know all the parts of the egg too. I think it's quite cool. It's amazing how we find these things and it kind of puts you in your place. It makes you remember the fact that it's not just us in, on the planet and it hasn't been just us that have been dominant on the planet. There's, there was a time where we weren't here and everything was working perfectly well. It's always nice to remember that. Well, it seems like for the little bit more of the show we have left, I'm going to try the hyena den one more time because I did find the other vehicle has left. So now we can go back and join and hopefully they won't be so sleepy. So in the meantime, while I make my way there, let us send you over to Jimmy and see what Tandy is up to. Well, folks, not much has changed. Um, what has changed is we've switched from daylight to a very special camera called an infrared camera. And as you can see, it's uh, got grayish uh, tones and it's uh, a little bit more grainy, but it gives us the advantage of viewing these animals um, in darker conditions without affecting them with bright lights on them. So it's a, a quite a um, artistic effect, and uh, it really does give us an advantage of viewing these nocturnal, well, these animals that are active at night. Um, and uh, it's a, it's a really a special camera, and uh, helps in enormously in these conditions. Without it, you wouldn't see it at all um, without shining lights on her. So it's fantastic uh, advantage for us. Um, you can see the, the tones now that Seb has pulled back. You can see how the sky has got this beautiful uh, pale blue uh, gray effect and then the, the grays and dark colors of the tree and leaves. Um, it, it's, it's actually very special to, to be able to see um, the effect of these cameras which he's slumbering on and uh, hasn't moved much to, at all while you've been um, up in the Mara. And uh, we're going to just sit around for a little bit longer. I don't think she's going to do much, but uh, we'll sit here for a little bit longer. Uh, no hyena uh, rocked in here while, while we've been uh, sitting with her in the tree. giraffe bull, my most memorable sighting of a leopard. I'll have to think a bit about that, but I would say seeing um, a female leopard in a rocky outcrop den with her cub. So she was at the entrance to her uh, uh, in a rocky outcrop and she was sitting at the entrance and the cub was just visual behind her to the side of her. And I would say that was very special, um, but I've been fortunate in having a number of uh, uh, memorable sightings of leopard. And obviously the, the action one's always good. Um, you know, hoisting kills up trees, interaction with hyena is always special. Um, and just watching them on, on the move, um, their hunting behavior, their stealth, their their, their patience is the patience is phenomenal and and so and yeah and big males you know moving uh, close to you you really get a sense of of the power of these these animals so I've had a number of uh, wonderful experiences with these cats um, but leopard and cubs is always very special I think we're going to 
I don't think she's going to do too much. We might leave her shortly and let her slumber on and uh, see if we can follow up on her tomorrow or if someone can follow up on her tomorrow and see whether she's had any success in the in the night. Um, I think she certainly was looking for something earlier, so I would imagine she might hunt on into the night. Oh, a bit of movement. <laughs> this could be good. Um, if she gets down to the next fork, we might get her coming down the tree. There we go. Have a bit of a stretch there, maybe. No. Yeah. Down the, hopefully down the right slope of the tree. No, hang. Come on, come this side, girl. Yeah. <laughs> She just marked against the tree. I don't know if you saw that. She had her tail up and she actually marked against that tree before she moved off. So, there she disappears into that tall grass. Oh, you can hardly pick her up. There we see a bit of, there's a little eye shining. See the dark patches behind the ears, that's all you can really see of her now. She disappears into the night. <laughs> We're gonna move back to the road and see, I don't want to follow her through here too much because I'm only gonna hit some logs and make huge noise for her uh, if she is hunting. We'll be heading off to the road, try and find a road and uh, leave you to Lauren in the Mara with some, apparently some storms building. Hey, get into gear. I feel any moment now we're gonna get swallowed by the storm that's rolling in. The sky is electric. It is dark, it is ominous, and it's gonna be some night ahead. I can only hope we make it back safely in time before the absolute downpour that is on its way makes it to us. But for now, we did try to give you a view of the lightning, but it's been very sporadic all of a sudden, and we're not quite managing to get the perfect view for you. But I can assure you, it is absolutely electric right now. It's actually not that cold. Not as cold as I thought it would be, but the minute this rain comes, it is going to get a lot more chillier. Oh, I hope you are getting a view of the lightning flashing off in the distance there. We're just making our way through another gate at the moment. But before I do get swallowed up by the storm, it is obviously worth concluding our wonderful topic of communication today well non-verbal communication at least and of course we rely heavily on all of our senses for that and i'm going to get my spotlight out so i can actually see now one thing that fascinates me is as a child you are taught you have five senses eyes ear nose mouth and touch but the more i've read the more i've actually looked into this I'm not sure that's actually quite accurate, is it? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear if you do agree with me. What about the sense of pain that guides us through life and warns us not to go into dangerous situations? For example, putting your hand on a very hot stove. What about your sense of balance? Some people actually have a terrible sense of balance, all due to that inner ear. What about sense of gravity? All these different senses that we do use on a daily basis, they're not actually included in our senses. And of course, these are indeed what help us navigate and communicate through our daily world. 
So I don't know if you will agree with me, and I'd love, love, love to hear your thoughts. More than happy for you to disagree with me if you do think that we do indeed have more than our five senses that we regularly talk about on a daily basis. Now, of course, those five are the fundamental senses that we do use to communicate. And some prefer to communicate in different ways from others. Some are much more oral based, some are more auditory based. It's completely different. And then when you come to the world of animals, you've got to think of electro reception. What about seismic communication? What about turtles who actually use tectonic plates to navigate? What about... Oh, I'm lost there. I thought I saw something just popping its head up on the grass here, but it's very difficult to see. Yeah, what about all these chemo reception, electro reception, all these different ways that animals, especially even in the ocean, communicate and navigate? Sharks can feel electrical impulses and they can actually detect vibration. That is definitely something that is hard for us humans to envision because we can't do that. It is so out of our box that we contain ourselves in. So I have been informed many of you agree with me about the sense of pain, the sense of balance and all these other senses that we do forget about. I'm glad to hear it. Gut feeling, yes, that other sense that we probably do not speak about often. So although we are making our way through the storm and probably not doing a great job of it, Trishala has my favorite animal. Yes, I found myself a friend here. <laughs> Hello, cubby. <laughs> so this is one of Pretty's cubs. It's grown so much. Look how tall it is. Very, very sweet. Always when I come here, these two, Pretty's two, and Plonk must come to the car to say hello. Always. And I love it. I do love it. And when I have to say to them, stop it, stop it, I half don't want them to stop, but they need to stop, of course, before they start chomping on tires. Look at that. Look at how grown it is. And the shape of the back is just so like, so like an adult. Monique, you'd like to know if the, did I hear that right? The submissive hyenas, if they are afraid when the, when the matriarch is around. I think that is what I heard. And in general, there is a certain pecking order. There is a certain pecking order. And when you see the lower ranked hyenas come through and they go to Corky, there's an immediate reaction and you can see exactly who's who's submissive or low ranking and exactly who is high ranking it's actually so obvious even at a, or especially at a kill because a low ranking hyena might only get about nine um about two kgs of food from a kill whereas a higher ranking hyena like corky would get as much as 18 kgs if she decides to gorge herself. But on average, she would get something like nine kgs. So it is really, really obvious. And if you say scared, Monique, I'm sure there is an element of fear, as in you don't want to sort of make the matriarch angry with you, because if she is, then she might just decide that she's had enough and she wants to get rid of you. And if she decides that and you can't fight back, then you have a problem. Ah, Nina has just tell, uh, told me if they asked me if they feel safer when the matriarch is around or the high ranking a hyena is around. Well, I suppose there's a bit of both. I often think of hyena social structure or hierarchy a lot like the mafia if that makes sense so although there is a top dog 
and he will take care of you or she will in this case she will take care of you no matter what and you are part of her clan you are slightly in fear that she might just snap at you but then at the same time she's also protecting you so it's a bit of a catch-22 and you want to make sure that you are always on the right page and here you corky wants to oh well the subordinate females want to make sure that corky knows that she's totally totally respected and that unless they're deciding to overthrow her they better toe the line and you will see it clearly when corky is around and the other hyenas come through very very clear in fact maybe next drive we'll be lucky enough to be able to see that there've been lots of activity around here and lots of hyenas coming through and the greeting ceremonies are quite spectacular and you can see exactly who's who it's a really nice little scenario to watch how everybody fits in well it's been an awesome drive and this little cubby says good night as he goes back into the den yes and of course thank you so much for your questions and comments we always love having you guys on board and we'll see you in the morning for the sunrise safari Thank you.